Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. The Expert Network Team consists of Carl Frank of AI Financial, Mike Miller of Miller and Associates CPAs, Jeff Cromendike of Security First Insurance Agency, and I'm Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, for real-life opportunities we see on a daily basis. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network Team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. We encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Welcome to today's podcast. I'm Carl Frank. And I'm Nathan Merrill. Good speed, Merrill. And we are so excited to have you. We are going to talk about taxes. Today's going to be kind of a tax free for all because... uh, it is just me and Carl, no special guest. I wish we could go tax-free, but yes, it's going to be a random amount of taxes thrown at us. What a crazy world we live in, Nate. Yeah, and we're going to basically be special guesting each other here. You'll be partially a special guest, and I'll be partially a special guest. <laughs> and we're going to try and keep it optimistic, but I mean, we might as well just begin with it. This is the second largest tax increase in America's history that was presented by President Joe Biden very recently at his, at his speech in front of Congress. Holy and I'm, I'm going to say, for the sake of our country, I certainly hope that it doesn't all pass. But in terms of what's proposed, it is... Um, it's a big deal. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it would certainly put them in the history books. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe in his mind it's for a good thing, but... Uh, as I see it, again, I'm an unabashed libertarian. I just think this is uh, moving the country in a massively wrong direction. Nate, I can't tell you. I mean, I was shocked at when he added it all up, what this really means. Um, but, I mean, I think from an individual standpoint, I mean, a lot of people just don't even really get it. Like, they don't really see it. And they hear the words, and they say, oh, it's really only a tax on the rich. It, could that be the case? Well, it it can be, except for the indirect impact of right. taxation. So right. without getting too philosophical, yes, they have only proposed tax increases that directly affect those making 400000 or more above, you know, above that. But I'll speak to that in a second because I think there's some um, vulnerability in that statement as it is. And it gets to the other part of this discussion, which is the spending side. So if we can quickly focus on the reason why they want to raise revenue in the first place is not just to raise revenue. They want to spend a ton of money, and they've got, you know, $4 trillion or whatever it is they've basically already got on the books for this year, plus $2 trillion of additional spending, so that's 6 And I think they've got $4 trillion more slated to try to get approved before the end of the year. So that's Absolutely $10 trillion in total. Absolutely amazing numbers. Yeah. What was our GDP last year? 16 Yeah. And that might be down from the year before, but we're talking about more than half of our entire country's production being government spending. That's a big deal. Yeah, it really it really is. And and why I say that's relevant to our discussion of taxation is even I think it was even yesterday, may have been today, I saw um Joe Biden talking where he basically said that it will be it will not add a penny to the national deficit. Well whether he was talking debt or deficit, I mean that it's always a question whether he knows what he's talking about. But he said deficit. I think he meant debt because it is all deficit spending. We don't collect ten trillion dollars in receipts. Well, not for, even close. Right, and and he so, but why I think that's interesting and relevant to our discussion of taxes. If he thinks that's true, then that's the reason why he needs to raise the revenue. He needs to get the spending bills passed first to have a real issue to sell to the American people on why we need the taxes. Because the way the taxes are presently polling is not favorable. 
Oh my goodness, I got to tell you, taxes are never popular. Well, we'll put in the uh, liner notes for today's podcast okay. a link to a great graph that just summarizes the the spending already spent and where it's all going. Uh, and who knows where the new spending bills will go. But already the amount of money that's been spent is huge. So yeah, that's the reason why uh, we've got big tax increases coming. And, uh, and the ones that are proposed from the speech last week um, they're pretty big in and of themselves. Right. So going back to the, the vulnerability, maybe this is the time to bring it up. So he said that he's not going to raise taxes. Janet Yellen said that no taxes are going to be raised on anyone making 400000 or less in a year. It's not clear whether that's joint or individual because, you know, if you're a single individual making 400000 um, does that mean that – how does the marriage penalty basically factor into that? But that aside, once they start scoring the revenue-raising bills – they'll find that there's no way they can close that number. I mean, th- there's no human, humanly possible way that the revenue, even as bad as it, it is that we'll be going through, that it raises $10 trillion to make this deficit neutral. There you go. Um, so, so then the vulnerability is, well, we, we wanted to promise you that it wouldn't go below 400, but now we're taking it down to 200. And then that's when you start affecting a whole lot more people than just the you know nasty one percenters up there. Yeah, there's a real vulnerability there. Well, let's take a look at what he's promoting. And, uh, and the first one is the income tax. It's actually the easiest, perhaps, to understand. Uh, we all pay an income tax on the dollars we earn. And, and the highest rate for the wealthiest people in the country right now is 37. He's going to increase that to 39.6. But it's a trick in many points of view because you're also going to pay in another 3.8% on top of that with something called a net investment income is also going to apply to your income. And he'll probably also reset the brackets. If you remember with the 2017 reform, the thresholds moved up. So whereas the highest tax bracket kicked in at 400 and something, it moved up to 600 and the rates went down. So... Um, what in all likelihood will happen is not just the rates going up, but the break points coming down. Go back down to 400. Right. That's exactly right. And that's a big, that's a big uh, point. Captures 200,000 more of people making in that range. Well, that's a big tax increase for the people who are in that bracket. And, and like you said earlier, that's why perhaps a lot of us look at this and say, oh, you know, it's only the very wealthy who do that, right? It's people over 400,000, and maybe I'm under 400,000, and I don't have to worry about it. But that really starts to, to grow because they're moving the bracket down by quite, amount, quite a big amount. That could happen again. And I think it's really tricky, actually, to throw in another 3.8% tax into the income bracket that used to only be for a different type of income called a long-term capital gain. Right, and that tax was designed strictly for funding Obamacare. Now he's basically using it as a general fund revenue raiser. So are you telling me that they could apply that tax, that there might be a tax that is specifically designated and in the future they might change that? Could the government actually do that? Yeah, with with revenue, with general revenue raising stuff, they can say, you know, it was originally passed to fund X Y Z program, and now we're going to apply it much more broadly. There's nothing that precludes them from doing uh, that. It's just so tricky, isn't it? It just drives you crazy, doesn't it? They might as well just say we're raising the top bracket up to forty two, whatever. But but that's like way too straightforward, isn't it? We're going to be a little bit tricky here. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, again, when it comes to tax hikes. Even on the wealthy, ironically, um, you still have to sell it. People have to buy that you're not just... It's just tricky. Yeah. It's all smoke and mirrors. Well, that's the income tax. The biggest percentage tax increase happens on the long-term capital gains. So right now, if I own an investment, I hold it for 366 days or longer. That could be a home. That could be a collectible. That could be a... um, Business. That could be a business, right, that I built my whole family off of for years and years and years. Or it could just be equities in the market, right, stocks. And I own it for that long. Then I pay a lower tax rate when I sell it. When I transfer it to another person, uh, there's a lower tax paid. Under the Biden proposal, it's going to go all the way up to the same number as the income tax rate. That's almost double. All right. So keep in mind the the origins of the long term capital gains rates. It's been at several different rates over the years, but the the origins, the policy idea behind it is to incent people to make long term investment in the market to you know fuel growth of the economy. Um, 
we are going to give them a preferential tax rate for making those long-term investments because the more the longer you put your capital at risk, I mean, this is where you could lecture all the day long, Carl. Right. The longer you put your capital at risk in an investment, the more chance it has to go up, down, whatever. Sure. So you're taking a, that the market you have to risk. Wait to get your money back, the more risk you take. So what he what is being done here? Let, let me just ask you this broadly: If we take capital gains rates all the way up to ordinary income rates. How does one view their commitment to the market, and how how does it change the way they approach their investments? Well, it could change dramatically, right? I'm going to want to get all of my investments if I'm a if I'm an investor uh, into any sort of a tax deferred vehicle I can. Any way that I can defer those taxes, I can make more money over the long haul. And if there's no difference to me anymore between being taxed at income versus a, a capital gain. I'll completely change my investment portfolio to get it all deferred as quickly as I can. And and so there's some opportunities, but mostly it's a big cost. Conceivably, it could also fuel swings in the market, because whereas now the long-term incentive, to some extent, stabilizes the market, if, if you have no preference for holding an investment for five days versus five years, you're going to take your money and run. It's, you know we, what I'm saying? It can, we thought GameStop was crazy. Right. And, and all the things with Reddit and you know, the, these crazy casino-like apps that you can buy to, to you know, day trade. Yeah, this could absolutely make all of that worse. So here's, this is the uh, perhaps a cynical conspiracy theorist side of the possible incentive there. It's something you said pointed out to me. If, if it could cause a flight to tax-exempt yeah. investments, right? Right. Well, one group that has a significant amount of Tax exempt investments right now is the uh, Fed. They bought about five trillion dollars of uh, federal issued bonds. Yeah, that's right. That they could be looking to exit out of here. And if there's a tax incentive for people to buy those, even now, with the low return, it got much bigger, didn't it? Yeah. 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 There's some. There's there's some possibilities there. There's some potential nefarious intent. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not going down that path for you. <laughs> You go down that. You go down that on a different podcast, my friend. Yeah, I love it though. I mean, I, I mean, I, it's really important that we understand. I mean, we're almost doubling the tax that investors pay, and you can't just wipe that off because mom and pop have investments. In America today, being able to control your money, it's a it's a survival skill. Now, survival the skill. capital gains increase is for those who we're talking over the million dollar. Yeah, that's right. Income so, level. But right. that's going to hit a lot of folks who have businesses that well, sell their the businesses or, or chill. Or, and that'll be our next topic, inheritors. Yeah. Inheritors. Right. Ouch. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, this is where it all gets very, a little complex is when you inherit the money, one of the things that Biden's looking to do is get rid of the step up in basis. That's right. We'll jump on that in a minute. Okay. Well, and, and also just real estate, right? I mean, so if you're trying to plan something, and especially in Colorado, I mean, the, the real estate, our commercial real estate is huge, but the residential real estate has gone up at a huge percentage, and a lot of people will be hit by this. So, so add on whatever income you've got this year, plus whatever gains you might get from your investments, add on any sort of transactions you might have in real estate and business, and before you know it, you could hit these huge tax brackets. The poor in folks year. in California who are already, they're paying 13% rates of income in California, add on that 43% for... Yeah. huge. More than half your money. More than half your money's gone. It's very sad. Yeah, ouch, right? And there are a lot of states that are like that. I mean, Colorado, I think, is still in the lower half as far as the state income tax rate. Oh yeah, it's it's very much within the competitive range. Yeah, but start to think this through. Percent. So if I can buy a home and sell it for less than that income tax burden of a million dollars in other states, I would be willing to pay more in an income tax in those other states. It'll make Colorado less competitive. Well, let's take a look at the estate tax because that's a huge one. It's an absolutely huge one. If you're going to inherit mom and pop's house and it's in Colorado, um, you could very easily hit that million-dollar threshold. So, Nate, what's going on with the estate tax? Well, so right now the estate tax is at $11.2 million per individual. So husband and wife can die leaving assets of 22, let's just call it $22.5 million bucks. Um, without incurring any estate tax. Once you exceed that threshold, you're taxed at the rate of 40%. What is being discussed is is twofold, as we've already alluded to. The first is a retrenchment of that exemption. So the available exemption 
is proposed to retreat to three and a half million, which is what it was back in 2009. Yeah, that's a fraction of what it and is. And you now. consider the amount of wealth that has been created over the past 10 years in both the recovery from the Great Recession and just the boom economy we've had the last few years, the retrenching to a three and a half million dollar level is not necessarily returning to a norm. It's going literally backwards. Yeah, it includes a lot more people than were right. included in 2009, no doubt about it. Right. So, granted, you know, combined $7 million worth of wealth is still significant wealth, but then they add the double whammy on that in the sense that they are doing away with this step-up in basis. So normally when you would inherit assets, you would take a fair market value basis in those assets on everything but, you know, uh, retirement accounts, that sort of thing. So that when when the family then sold those assets to divvy them up among heirs, they wouldn't pay income tax at that point. That is no longer proposed to be the case. They are talking about eliminating the step up in basis. So you inherit mom and dad's house. It's not clear if this goes to everybody, but let's just take a hypothetical where where mom and dad own a house that's worth six hundred thousand dollars. That is their only asset, so they don't have a taxable estate. The seven and a half million exemption covers them. Children inherit the house and uh, say it's got a very low basis, functionally $50,000 or something like that. Now they're paying 25% essentially on the gains realized when they sell mom and dad's house. Oh, so, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. But then the harder part of that is, that, you know, how do you even know what mom and dad have in a cost basis in a house, right? I mean, and if you don't know, you it, have to assume the zero. Worst. You have to assume zero if you can't show otherwise. That's now, right. You, you might be able to pull up the original deed and at least come up with their original cost. And what about the improvements and all that? Yeah, you, I mean, if you don't have records, you don't have basis. Right? So that's the bottom line there. Oh, my gosh. What a mess that is. So, um, so yeah, this could hit families in a significant way. It could really... Um, it could really affect the significance of inheritances. And not only that, it could affect folks and their behavior of what they do with an inheritance. So now you're putting yourself in that situation where you're inheriting mom and dad's house and you realize that on a $600,000 sale, you'll, you're paying nearly, you know, 150000 in tax. You might, and this, this could, you know, see itself manifest in the markets as well. You might just hold on to that house. Oh, my goodness. Until you hit a much higher value, in which case you're willing to sell the house. And so the way I explain it is the hurdle for the investment now has to increase dramatically mm -hmm. for you to be incented to sell the asset. And that's going to affect all of your neighbors, too. And so they're not going to want to sell either. And so the market might actually go the opposite way. Right. Right, without any without any sort of um, uh, market incentive, you know, it, this it changes everything. It changes everything, and so we all might be trying to do the same thing, and and all of us really being hurt by it. We can't all line up on the same side of a transaction. And, and that's one of the, you know, I was mentioning earlier how they score these things. I think I, I made reference to that that when they're talking about a revenue raising bill, they they make certain assumptions about behavior that go into how they discuss or project how much revenue is going to come out of the bill. But the reality is that once you start taxing behavior, the behavior changes. Yeah, so they can't right. make those continuing assumptions about, well, here's how behavior is now regarding stock accounts. Here's how behavior is now towards real estate investment. It changes everything when you start taxing the behavior. That's exactly and it right. actually reminds me of a, a, a quick little story about um, some of you, our listeners may remember there was a big brouhaha about New York instituting a uh, a sugar tax on soft drinks, on uh, fountain served soft drinks, because they wanted to. They felt it was responsible for increasing obesity among the population. So it was kind of a sin tax that they were going to tax fountain, you know, right over soft a certain drinks. size. But then when they presented the model for the revenue to the uh, city, not city council, but you, the state legislature, they showed no change in behavior. And so the revenue looked was this, amazing. Yeah, it looked like amazing. And, and they're saying, but wait a minute, we're adopting this. You know, the whole premise for this tax is that we're going to disincent people from actually doing it. And that's the reality. So what would have happened with this revenue model had it actually been accurate is it would have showed some initial growth in revenue, but as people change their behavior and they start buying canned soda pop instead of fountain drinks or whatever Less whatever revenue. was necessary to change their behavior but enjoy the same benefits, 
they would have not, the revenue would have dissipated and it wouldn't have been a significant revenue raiser and it probably still wouldn't have actually accomplished the goal. And that's how tax that's how things generally get works. That's how things get passed. Yeah. They're, they're, their forecasts are always misleading. Yeah, it's really frustrating. It's what they do to sell the bill mm-hmm. and, and get it passed through Congress because it becomes revenue neutral. But it once the behavior adjusts to the new disincentive or incentive, it normalizes revenue, which is why the old adage of um, receipts will always be 20% of GDP. When you, when you carry a program out long enough, behavior will always adjust so that either G- GDP will shrink so that even if you're taking in the same amount of revenue, it's going to be 20%, or you grow GDP and you grow receipts. I love it. So in a future podcast, we'll dive into that, and, and it'll be a really good, really good conversation. We're also going to dive into the estate tax in greater detail. Uh, soon. I think that one more thing that I'd love to talk about real quickly, though, is is um, uh, the real estate. The real estate, to me, is a huge gotcha. And well, and this is another one where it's just like they're really messing with the markets. No kidding. Because as, a, as someone who's – my practice has long involved – obviously, I'm a tax attorney, so it's long involved very – well-known strategies like 1031s, and now they're talking about essentially removing that from the code. So let's describe to everybody, what's a 1031? So 1031 is what's called a like-kind exchange, where I can sell property and exchange those proceeds into like-kind property um, and defer my tax. So just basically carry over the transaction like it was an exchange. And there's a lot more complexity that goes into how these are actually pulled off. But in 2017, they actually took out provisions related to tangible property exchanges. So those are gone away. That would be things like airplane for airplane, equipment for equipment. And that's where usually you saw tangible property exchanes was in... Those types of things. But what they gave them instead was bonus depreciation. So it kind of negated the need for a 1031 when they got bonus depreciation. So now... This is sometimes a problem. When you take something away, it never comes back when I'm sure they'll get rid of bonus depreciation, but they won't give back the 1031 exchange for tangible property. So it will just be a tax increase indirectly. But with real property, what we're talking about is something that very much drives the the larger investment property arena. I mean, we're talking about stuff that, you know, the office building you work in, the... The um, industrial complexes where the goods you buy are made. Well, and uh, if you're renting the apartment building you're in, I mean, this is a common, this is common, this is actually a late night infomercial is what we're talking about right now. You can watch any television channel very, very late. And the real estate fix and flipper guys who are on TV or on the website promoting this thing, 1031 exchanges is how they do it. You can basically defer your proceeds from real estate until you die. It it permits money to actually move in the marketplace without tax disincentives. And and that's possible. That might go away. In which case, the capital stops moving. And that's the scary part, at least to me in this, is once once you chill the availability of, of potential buyers and sellers, the market just freezes and... I, yeah. I don't want to be a doomsdayer, but it's just a massive it is. change in the capital markets that are particularly in those high-end areas, investment properties and that sort of thing. We're not talking about – I mean, sure, people use it with their investment properties, their one-off rentals, right. that sort of thing. Surely. But the bigger market for this, and we're talking billions and billions of dollars, is in the Big property. Big properties. Right. Um, and how the money moves around those areas. It's a big deal. So you add up all of these tax increases, and we haven't even talked about the one making the news, which is a tax on the corporations. Just real quickly, Nate, how much are they going up? Well, the proposal is presently we're at 21. They're proposing 28. Um, Joe Manchin, who is a Democrat senator whose vote they need, has says he's not comfortable with anything over 25. So, that's so your a, guess still is as good as mine. Increase. 25 is... Is respectable. I mean, again, I don't. Here's the problem with corporate taxes: corporations can just pass the tax cost on in the, in the cost of their goods. Right. So, ultimately, it becomes a tax on either employees or customers. It doesn't necessarily always hit corporations the way the politicians like to suggest it does. So, corporations themselves might be indifferent to it as long as they can neutralize the effect through charging more. Right. 
And, um, and what makes the news? What makes the news? Of course, are you know these these stories about companies who offshore a lot of their revenues and, and avoid taxes, and so there'll be a corporate minimum tax that they're talking about, regardless of where your income is yeah. made. And that 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 often repeated story is you know corporations don't pay any income tax. There's like a dozen. I know. That didn't pay a dozen major corporations that didn't pay any income tax. It's a very small number of clients. Yeah. There, there, there are a handful of them. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's largely a myth. But it is frustrating, right? And so it makes the news and it helps you sell the tax. Even the myth is frustrating because then clients approach us and say, well, why, am I, why am I paying why tax? Why do I have to pay? Well, it's not exactly what you think. Yeah. But, you know, you think of Amazon and how much they've invested in new structures and equipment. Sure. The, the, and done it on a leveraged basis. They I, borrow the money. Of course, they can create deductions to offset their income because there's, they've just expanded massively. But that'll eventually catch up with them, presumably. But. And they can hire the lawyers to figure out their own problems. So for the real world where we live, I mean, that's not the corporate tax is really small. But boy, if you add that up, right? We just talked about an income tax increase, a capital gains tax increase. We talked about an estate tax increase. We talked about the loss of stepped-up basis. And we talked about the loss of what they're now calling a loophole, the 1031 exchange for investment real estate um, investors. That's a big deal. This is the second biggest tax increase in the history of America. Yeah, brace yourself. Percentage-wise, dollar-wise, it's by far the largest. Yeah, I do, dollar wise, I don't think they get nearly what they say they're going to get out of it, and and that's why I say brace yourself. You can see the economy put on its brakes in a way that you never could have imagined. And you know, even if right, I'll I'll, I'll stick my optimistic hat on here. Even if the economy, which in, by many measures is the strongest of our, by certainly the strongest of our lifetimes, mm -hmm. and and maybe the strongest in American history. It's the strongest certainly since 1957, uh, by most measures, if not all measures, and it could be the strongest in the history of America right now at this exact moment. Coming out of COVID, it's just on fire. It's setting records and all sorts of measures. Maybe if you're going to do it, now is the time to do it. So we'll we'll keep this optimistic hat on when you've got the the revenues growing. You've got that. Um, you know, possibility if you're going to do it. Apparently, they think now is the time. Yeah, no, and that's why I said earlier, even with the soda pop example, behaviors won't change immediately. Um, and and but the change will come. Mm -hmm. Behaviors will change. I know. And so when I say put, you know, brace yourselves, it's not because immediately the day after it passes, everything changes. But that's when things start to change, and and the, the long term effects of tax increases and changes the way we're talking about are dramatic. What do you call it? You uh, what I love one of the things about you unintended consequences of. Yeah, it's just it's one of the unintended consequences. And even if it's a well intentioned practice, and I'm not even sure this one is. Yeah, I mean that's where again you can get me on my uh, soapbox cynical. Uh, streak <laughs> is talking about what are they actually because i right it's big there's a lot of stuff here uh this this really does in my honest attempt at objective analysis this is um i, I can't honestly tell you what it, what they're trying to accomplish here i because uh, it will grab a fair amount of revenue up front, but you know the, some of these spending bills are ten years long, and the revenue is designed to supposedly match that ten year spending and there 's just there 's you can 't point to a ten year period in history where response to tax legislation has been constant isn 't that amazing and, and and what a dramatic change i mean the, the, just six months ago you never would have seen a bill like this so so yeah, so ten years out. How can you predict? Well, golly, I'm really excited about it because <laughs> if nothing else, it's an opportunity for people to get to know our expert team better. In a, in a world like you need a team of experts, you need a tax expert like yourself, an investment person to help you who can help you with the diversification, an insurance expert like uh, we've got with Jeff and, the, and of course, um, Mike Miller, CPA, or, or another expert like that. Yeah, because, you know... As you know about me, I don't take defeat easily. So they can change up the entire code on me. 
I will invest the time um, with my colleagues as necessary to understand what remains, what changes, how we basically, you know, you mentioned the concept of a loophole. There is no such thing as a loophole. It's just right. using the code and how it's designed to work to your favor. And I, I could point out a few things that aren't presently on the quote unquote chopping block that will become very powerful tools. Once again, going forward. Yep. What's old is new again. Right. Yep. Exactly. So and experts will help you find them. Um, and, and it's funny because I know that when we gave uh, presentations on the 2017 reform bill, the tax reform bill, which really was very favorable for taxpayers, we still kind of lamented that one of the big winners in all that was the CPAs because right. it was rather complex. Oh, my goodness. And I think it's funny here in your, in your uh, you know, summary of the big winners and losers of, the, uh, of legislation like this, one of the big winners is CPAs, advisors and CPAs who can help you <laughs> remain... <laughs> <laughs> Somewhat tax efficient in a very challenging environment. Well, so. we go tax free to the best we can. Right. Great podcast, Nate. Thank you for your expertise. Thanks. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else and join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at, at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expert networkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented, nor does it constitute legal, investment, or accounting advice and the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through a Financial Services, and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.